two years on the leadership of the church. So if you feel called to anything, please make sure you write it out. If there's a new ministry that is not there, feel free to make a note at the end, pass that on to us, and we'll consider if the Lord is calling us to make inroads into new areas. Amen? Amen. I began to write this sermon from the time that I began to do ministry. My first encounter with marriage counseling, I was in Federalsburg, Maryland. Uh, the most active couple in church, the wife calls me up and tells me, Pastor, I am going to see you at church. I'll be there in half an hour. I have never had uh, marriage counseling before. I had marriage counseling done to me and my wife. I have been part of training on doing marriage counseling. I have never done marriage counseling. It was about 10 years ago. And I'm going to the church, Pastor. You need to fix what's wrong with my husband. And uh, they... Surely as it was, half an hour later they arrived. We had an amazing conversation. I listened. I allowed them to talk to each other. They came out and strong marriage until now. We still talk. Uh, they're wonderful people still very involved in the Bible. In the, in the Bible and the church. Amen. And I learned one thing quickly. We have mystified or made it a taboo to have trouble in our marriages. So it's something you don't talk about. By the time you begin talking about it, you might be talking about it to the wrong people. And that leads to more trouble and tribulation than you actually began on the wrong, if you actually began on the right foot. Let's explore that a little bit. We'll see what the Bible has to say. We'll talk about some experiences and see how we can demystify having trouble in our marriages. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father, we all are human, sinful. None of us are perfect. None of us have a perfect marriage, but we want to, O oh Lord. We want to seek the perfection that you give. We want the marriages that you promise that if we hold on to you and to your word, you shall give us. Give them to us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 4, 2 and 3, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You will see a couple of things as we go. Usually, most people say that divorce happens or the marriages end because of unfaithfulness. I'm here to tell you that 90% of the time the marriage was already over by the time that that happened. Or if the marriage is on certain track, it usually doesn't end because of lack of intimacy or adultery. Usually, I, I have yet to experience maybe a handful uh, through my years in the church that separated because of infidelity. 99% of the cases I have dealt with that ended in divorce was because of the first two. Finances, and number two, communication. Finances, I believe, if marriage was a bridge and you're to meet in the middle, there are many planks along that rope bridge. And when you're walking on those, uh, on those planks on that bridge to get to meet in the middle, finance is the quickest way and the fastest way to begin to remove individual planks from the marriage. And if you allow the finances to begin to rule the marriage, you will take enough planks out of the middle of that bridge that as soon as you step on it, you will be stepping into the void and you'll never meet in the middle. Finances lead to communication breakdown, which leads to intimacy issue, which ultimately leads to divorce. In fact, if you go on Google uh, financial issues in marriage, the biggest top law firms will tell you most marriages begin and end with finance issues. Let's explore a little bit of how those financial issues affect us. And we're going to talk about finances here a little bit. We're not going to go too in-depth. But number one, debt, money management, and lack of financial plan. I'm going to say this. I wasn't instructed too well about my finances when I was growing up. I went to the church financial seminar. You know what they told me? Grab yourself a credit card and start building credit. I was showing uh, Anthony Simpson a uh, um, news article this morning. We're talking about it. One in seven Gen C people, that is people born around 1995, 20 to 22 years old, one in seven of them have maxed out all their credit cards. 
one in seven, you meet seven of them, one of them has maxed out their credit cards, about half of them owe at least $5,000 in credit card debt. That's under 22 years old, they already owe 5,000. If they take four to five years to pay that off, they would have paid almost triple the amount they borrowed. Imagine beginning your life with $15,000 worth of debt. That's not talking about student loans and other financial strains that you will have, like medical bills and so on and so forth. I was told to build my credit until somebody told me the other day, the bank will love you more if you have no credit, if you have two years of good paychecks, and the only loan that you're willing to get is a mortgage, you will be giving a better interest rate than if you have a long history of credit if you come to your bank with 20% savings, if you come to your bank with two years of good paychecks that qualify you for a loan, but you have no credit history, your bank will manually underwrite and understand this is a person who doesn't like that. They're willing to come with us. And the only debt they will have is a mortgage. They will pay for their house. They're not gonna get into other debt. They're not gonna try to take out a brand new $1,000 a month car these people are somebody wise who was able to save 20% and get into absolutely no debt. You'll have equal to credit score to that person that has 10, 20 years. And somebody told me that and I was, that blew my mind. I didn't even think that that was possible. Because hey, I was always told if you have no credit and you show up to the bank, they'll never give you a loan. But if you have your 20%, if you have a salary stable, if you've been paying your taxes for the past two years, and the bank can see that you're stable, they'll manually write it in and they'll give you a recommendation for a good rate because you are a person who is not dependent on debt and the only debt you have is with them. I, I, maybe I'm wrong, I know some, there's a lot of financial people here. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. After that, I think my wife and I started canceling credit cards and we're, we're gonna try to get rid of all of them. Uh, honestly, we did get into strains. Um, at one point in our, in our marriage, we had to take out a loan to help family members. And it really put a strain on us. We had to talk about it. So I became boring. Manage your money and make a plan for your money. The Bible mentions that do not be one who shakes hands in pledges or puts up securities for debts. Proverbs 22, 26. The Bible has two mentions of debt. One is money. One is the debt that is owed because of sin. The debt that is owed because of sin has only one payment. What is that payment? Blood of Jesus Christ or death of us. Neither one. One is great because we have salvation. The other one is complete annihilation. Every other time that it mentions debt, when it comes to money, it mentions it in an unfavorable term. Get rid of it. Forgive it. Don't have it. Don't look for it. Do not be a fool and shake hands in pledges of security. Get rid of your debt. It will put a strain on your marriage. Do not begin with debt. Do not end with debt. If there is a need, save up so you can become your own credit card. If you have at least three months of your salary saved up to pay for all the bills for the next three months, your transmission blows out in your car, it's, oh man, I'm gonna have to dip into my savings. If you have no savings and you're only counting on your credit cards for an emergency and your transmission goes out, it's gonna put a strain on your marriage. Because now we can't afford it because all our money is going to certain bills and certain debts. And if you add something on top of that, now it's a strain. And that begins to take off a plank in that bridge that you're building with your spouse. That's the beginning of marital strain. Let's demystify the fact that we need to talk about money often and talk about money well. Money management in the Bible. Honor the Lord with wealth, with the fistfuls of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your baths will brim over with new wine. Let me tell you this. If you don't have savings, if you're not secure, when you give to God, it's a strain. When you talk about money with your spouse, it's a strain. If you save in the storehouses, if you bring what's to God in the storehouses, have you ever seen the financial statements of the church? Uh, raise your hands if you've seen the financial statement of the church. See, when you put money into youth department, 
You can't have Sabbath school say, I want some of that money. But all of us save like that money belongs to us. Or give money to the church like it's not a sacrifice. Let me explain that to you slowly and break it down. When we put money for youth department, nobody touches that money by youth department. When you and your family save money for a new vehicle or for a replacement vehicle, you can't have an emergency where that money is allowed to be touched. Your cousin might be sick, it's okay. If we have some other money separate for that, what my wife and I did, we did community money. We do our tithing, we do our offering, and we do a 3% for community. If there's somebody in need, we have money for that. If there is no money, we have no money. We can't touch our savings to help a family member if no, it leaves our family vulnerable to having issues. Do not allow the money to become an issue for your family. Plan and plan well. Talk and talk often. Communicate what are we going to do with this money and what are we not going to do with this money. If you do not have those conversations, those conversations will be had for you. Have a plan for your finances. Talk about money often. Sit down and explore all available funds are then potential uses. Save with a purpose, save wisely. If you do not have a plan for your money, your money will plan your life. That's better, I should have, should have put, wrote that down. If you do not plan what to do with your money, every penny that comes into your bank account, that money will make a plan for you. And believe me, the plan that the money has is driven by commercials, is driven by a consumerist mentality, is you're not gonna enjoy it. You're gonna end up in debt, spending. And there's a lot of people here working a second job so they can spend more money. Let me tell you, if you have savings of three or four months and you have a structure to save, a boring structure, a couple of dollars here and there every month to your necessities and to the emergencies, once you're comfortable with that, you're not looking to spend more my whole life I thought, well, maybe I need a second job. Maybe I need to work more. You don't. If you have a well-established financial plan, you do not need to go crazy chasing more money in order to spend more. You will understand that I can live with less. If you're in debt, you don't need to go get a steak dinner. Rice and beans is okay, amen? It might be for a while, but you do not build savings, but nice saving and keeping a certain lifestyle. We might need to step down. For most of our marriage, my wife and I didn't plan too well. And it got to the point where it was an issue. We had to talk about it. So I became excessively boring and excessively tedious about it. My wife, I don't know if she opens up the Excel sheets I send her. It's like Google Docs. She, she doesn't. She just shook her head no. But I make an Excel sheet for everything. The same one that you see in the church, having all the different departments getting money each month, I have one for our household, and I send her the sheet when I'm done doing the paper, the, that for the month. I have a, a sheet for the debts that we have and how we're going to pay them off and how much money is going in into each month. I have a sheet for the things that we do in the house. We need money for uh, new siding. We need uh, money for this, money for that, and I send her that. And I am tedious. It's kind of boring. It is. But if you do not put in the work, how can you expect your marriage to work? Let me tell you. I had a friend who bought a vehicle, the first uh, pastor, uh, the first church I was a youth pastor at. So he just came from his home country. He got a good contract and he built something in somebody's house, I think a bathroom or something. He got $10,000. He went and he got himself a Nissan Altima. The Nissan Altima, he got it cash. And I told him, well, you didn't get into a debt or anything. He got it for like eight grand. So he drove it for a week or two and then he told me, pastor, my car broke down. Can you help me look at it? So I go there, I put the keys on, and I turn it on, and I see that the needle for the gas is all the way down. He had been driving it for a week and hadn't put gas on the car. And then I sat down with him, and I explained to him a couple of things. This guy was a great worker, but back in his village, he had never seen a car. He learned to drive. He paid somebody to help him drive. He bought the car, but he didn't know even how the car works. I told him, first of all, you're going to have to change your oil this often, because I've seen young people grab a car, drive it for 80,000 miles, a brand new car, and never change the oil on it. Same thing with your marriage. You can't keep going 80,000 miles without an oil change. And people do that all the time in their marriages. 
they just keep going forward without any maintenance. You can't keep a marriage alive if you're not working on it. If you're not putting in work into your marriage weekly, your marriage is not going to last 80,000 miles. In fact, it might not even last five years. The work that you put into your marriage will be a merit that the Lord allows you to have a long and happy marriage. Communication. Let's switch topics. Finances. Very important. For whomever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. I'm not going to say, if you've spoken to me about marriage, it's not you. You're not the only one going through this. If you have had a conversation with me, this is not about you, whoever that might be. Let me tell you. Why am I going to say this? It's because everybody tells me the same thing. Everybody that I have ever known says the same thing always. And this is, Pastor, I'm having problems in my marriage. Please speak to my significant other and fix them, because they're the problem. Don't answer that one. Don't answer that one. Don't get yourself in trouble. 90% of the people that come to me ask me for help with their significant other to be fixed because they're the problem. Go talk to them because they are the problem. See, we all go through struggles. Each personality has a healthy way of dealing with things and an unhealthy way of dealing with things. There are people who are loving and peacekeeping and have all these good qualities, but when they confront it with a situation, they just fist emotionally and physically shut down and they just do not want to deal with it. That leads the other person that has a different personality to go and reach out of the marriage and say, I need help. But instead of looking for a counselor and a pastor, and you guys are lucky because you have me, you got Pastor Elvis, you got Pastor Inskip, and, and I'm sure there's a couple more pastors in the area that I'm forgetting to mention, Pastor Akeem, you have four people that you can call up and give you counseling for free before you even get to the therapy level and understand how you're feeling, process that before you even get... Most people, what they do is they go speak to the, the spouse's family, they speak to their own family, they start saying, oh, they're doing this to me and I can't take it anymore on my side and my story. My goodness, be careful how you speak. Matthew 18, we know it, amen? amen. Matthew 18, not only for your brother and sister, but also for your spouse. If you have an issue in your marriage, begin speaking to your spouse, communicate to them. Create a safe space. Bear with me for five seconds. Have you ever been able to tell somebody the difference between, hey, I'm feeling angry about the situation where I'm about to show you how angry I am about this. <laughs> There's a big difference, my brothers and sisters. When you're able to create a safe space where you say, look, I'm about to share some intimate things with you right now, and I need you to hear what I'm saying, have some active listening with me, I'm angry about such and such. But if you say it this way, you are humanizing yourself to the other person. The other person might take some time to really adapt. This is whether you've been married or you're going to get married. L do this. Active listen. Active listen. Express yourself clearly. Schedule regular check-ins. Practice empathy and compassion. And I get this sometimes. Pastor, I sat down and I spoke to my wife. We didn't resolve the issue. Now I need help. It takes a couple of check-ins to solve an issue in the household. You're not going to have one conversation with your spouse and everything is going to be rosy. It takes work. Oil changes, gasoline. It takes multiple different things. Maybe a whole different approach to speak to the person that you're sharing your life with or that you're going to share your life with or if you're training yourself to go that route. Active listening, you do not listen to response when your spouse is sharing with you an emotional thing that is happening to them. You listen to understand the feeling behind the words. Let me explain that be, uh, back to you for a second. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We all come to church. We sit down. We hear the pastor preach for half an hour, and we just say, amen. Amen? When you're listening to your spouse explain a situation that they're going through, what you're going to do is you're going to sit down and listen and not respond. You're going to try to understand why they feel the way they feel and how it got to that point. If you can do that, you will have the beginnings of active listening. Uh, technical difficulties. 
the worst time. That's all right. We'll get through it. Express yourself clearly. I, I grew up in a culture that I was told, if you have emotions, you're not a man. At, at my grandfather's funeral, I started to cry. My father told me, what are you doing? Get out. I wasn't allowed to finish the funeral because I was crying. So I came up from that culture. You don't have emotions until I understood you can't have healthy relationships if you don't explain how you feel. Not with your spouse, not with your friends, not with your family, no one. If you can't clearly and calmly express what feelings you're having, you can't truly communicate, active listen, or explore how the relationship is going. I recently had a conversation with somebody, and I expressed some feelings that I had. The person says, wow, I've never heard somebody explain how they were angry in that way. That was a very calm way to say you're angry. And I realized I was growing a little bit because I'm able to express how I feel without showing the person how I'm feeling. Because if you come with an attitude of anger, although you're angry, but if you can express it clearly and calmly, the other person might say, wow, there's something here. You know what I mean? It opens up the lines of communication where finance struggles and not agreeing on things takes away those planks. Explaining your feelings and building a safe environment for both of you to share how you're feeling creates more planks, strengthens the bridge. And if you continue to communicate that way, you will need to go to your friend who maybe, and I've seen this many times, and let's not say this, when some people are feeling like they're going to go through a divorce, they go to the friend who has already gone through a divorce, and that friend is going to tell you, their, their biggest advice or their most simple advice, oh, I got a great lawyer for you. <laughs> They're not going to even say, well, are you going to save your marriage? They're just going to give you a card for a good lawyer. And they're going to say, oh, and the other spouse is going to pay for it. This, this is a really good guy. <laughs> Let me tell you, divorce is messy. There's two aspects of that. Let's talk about it. People have a taboo in the church where they don't go seeking help. They have trouble in their marriage, they stop talking to each other, then things explode, they divorce, one of them leaves the church, they never come back, and now they can't be part of the social circles anymore. And I've seen that happen many times, especially in cultures like mine, and, and, and cultures that um, are more Caribbean, in, in the way of me saying that. In the Caribbean, back home, you divorce, one of them leaves the, the, the county, or goes to another state. Because there's a lot of shame involved in the fail of the marriage. Because you couldn't talk about it at the beginning. And if you talk to them years down the line, they'll say, man, that was, that was a dumb reason why I did that. I could have asked for forgiveness and we would have been fine. The kids would have been happier. And then there's other people that say, well, I'll never divorce. But they're in an unhappy marriage and the kids are going to need counseling. They made their choice. They separated while inside the marriage and now the kids need to go to therapy. Because they see mom and dad not talking to each other, not in the same room, well, why are they married? Why are we even in the same household if you're going to behave like that? Do not mystify or make taboo the issues in your marriage. Understand that when it gets to the point you can no longer communicate, you need therapy. When you move out, you don't need therapy, you need a lawyer. A lot of people say, Pastor, first, one of the first churches I went, second district I went into, First conversation, a lady comes up to me and says, Pastor, I need you to come talk to my kids and explain to them why I'm getting divorced because their father is so and so and so. I hadn't talked to the father. I didn't know. I couldn't go up to the kids and tell them, your, your dad is bad. Your mom is good. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to happen. I, I had a lot of conversations with her. He found out we were talking, so he came in and we had conversations. At the end, finance, communication. It was not about infidelity. It was not, and they ended up going separate ways. You know the first time they sat down with the therapist? After they had already been in court to file divorce. A lot of people wait to have a counseling session after they have already put in the divorce paperwork, and they have already been separated for a couple of months. I'm telling you, do not get to that point. Do not make it taboo if you have a problem in your marriage. Seek help. Follow Matthew 18. Talk to your spouse. If the issue cannot be resolved, then follow on to the second step, which is find counseling. 
Pastor Elvis, I, Inskip, Akeem, all for free. You can talk to us. It is a journey. You're not going to sit with a pastor in one session and fix your marriage. You're not going to fix it in six months. It might take years. But if you do not work on it, it will end up in divorce. Let's demystify that. Although culturally, the culture I come from, you don't talk about these things. You keep it all bottled up until it explodes, and then the whole church is privy to it. So you never communicated with your spouse. Now the whole church knows the issue. Let it not get there. Ephesians 5.33, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect the husband. Let's go into traditional gender roles for one second here. Husbands feel disrespected, wife feels unloved. And it begins a cycle where the husband comes into the house, he doesn't feel his uh, needs are being met, his uh, meal is not prepared, the house is not clean, and instead of saying to the wife, what, how, uh, how are you doing, or talking, or relating, he just starts to feel disrespected because he's the man of the house, and now I have to have my respect because this is my household. And we have, I, I come from that culture, and then the fight starts. The wife doesn't feel disrespected, she feels unloved. This man doesn't love me enough to understand me. And it creates a cycle that doesn't end because the husband keeps feeling disrespected by the wife uh, uh, feeling unloved. And they go back and forth. You hurt me, you hurt me. And the cycle doesn't end. You know where the cycle ends? Where they either split within the marriage or they actually go get the divorce. Because we have to stop the cycle of not understanding that intimacy is also a part of marriage. We have three parts of that. We have mental intimacy, spiritual, and physical. Mental intimacy is the conversations you have with your wife. Spiritual intimacy is the connection you build, not only through the Word of God, but when you communicate deep feelings of love and understanding and longing. It is practical to have those conversations before you even get into the marriage. But here's what happened. A lot of us got married young. A lot of us became married under, uh, under different circumstances. Even when we're older, if we got married, spiritual things are still important. Physical. And let me say this, because we're not going to go into the, the sexual part of things. We're going to keep it PG-13. Amen? There are physical intimacy that do not lead to any more acts than that. Sitting on the couch, holding hands, talking, hugging your spouse, giving each other a massage, and just having long conversations while you're looking at each other facing face to face with no objects in between the two of you. Having physical intimacy that is not about an act leads to a stronger marriage. I went to a, a three weekend seminar where this lady was explaining many things about marriage and she said, if you're not building physical intimacy that doesn't lead to an act with your spouse, you're missing out on a whole spectrum of your marriage. And that really boggled my mind how you could initiate uh, a relationship physically that doesn't have to end in an act. It is about connecting with the person emotionally, understanding that they are a human being that you are connecting with in a deeper level than just a relationship that you have with them. You're building that bridge, and you're strengthening it. See, the issue mentally is that when we feel overwhelmed, we begin to make all the excuses in the world why the other person is wrong and we're right. And when you go outside the marriage and begin to speak to friends, his family, your own family, about the issues that you're having in the marriage, you might find an ally, and that might be the worst thing for your marriage. Never look for an ally. I had the experience, uh, my, my wife and I had uh, counseling with those people. There was a lady who kept going from one um, counselor to the other. When the counselor would say, you're wrong, please do not go down this path, she would say, he's not the correct one, and would try to find a counselor. <laughs> that was... The husband very lovingly followed her around through multiple counselors, and every one of them would say the exact same thing. Do not go down that path. You are not thinking about this correctly. And she did not listen, of course. They ended up uh, separating. 
But here's the thing, don't go looking for allies in your struggle. That is something I see happen so often. That is not seeking counseling from some, a professional as a pastor, a counselor, or a therapist. That is not it. That is looking for a friend or a family member that you can tell all the bad things about that person, and they're going to say, yeah, yeah, I see that. Mm, he gets angry fast. Oh, yeah, she doesn't do much around the house, right? So that little support that you think your friend is helping you is building a barrier in your marriage that you should have been discussing with your partner. And in our culture, the first thing you do is you call mom and dad and you tell them everything that's wrong in your marriage. And they'll counsel you. Sometimes he helps. Sometimes he hurts. Some of us come from cultures where the closest you get to getting away from family is they build an, an extra house next to the house for when you get married. Or if they have a flat roof and they're in the city, they build a second house on top. Some people just don't move out. I grew up with my grandparents in the house, and we were separated for about 12 years. When my parents could get them in, my grandparents moved in with my mom. My grandma's still alive and living with my mother. And that is the culture. I come from the culture where if my father's going to come, it's a plan, it's a phone call. They can't just show up anymore. The culture has shifted. So I know I have the experience of one culture to the other. And I can, I can tell you, if you do not make those separations and those barriers for your family, because a man shall live his mother and father and create his what? His own family, his new nucleus. You have to understand that in all of that, there's challenges. You have to demystify talking about them. You have to prevent cheating happening in a mental, spiritual level. Like I said before many times, physical cheating rarely, rarely leads to divorce in the church. Financial or lack of communication usually leads to a lot more divorces than anything else. And it's sad to say, because we think that all divorces happen because one or the other spouse was unfaithful, and it's not. There's a lot to break down the marriage before we even get to that. Let me make the most important point of today, which is 1 Corinthians 7, 4. And if you come from a culture like mine, where the man is the man of the household, and he manages everything, and he's supposed to hold on to everything, let me tell you, partnership is a thing in the Bible. Amen? Amen. There are as many verses in the Bible talking about the equality of man and woman than there are of saying the man is the head of the household. There's only one of those. But there's many more Bible verses where it says you don't belong to yourself, you belong to the other. There's many other Bible verses that say understand the cycle of love and respect between a man and, and a wife. Here in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, it says the wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. But it doesn't stop there, because I've seen preachers preach that first part, but not the second one. I'm not going to mention who they are. In the same way, in the same, what, 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 in what way? Same, same. same way. The husband does not have authority over his own body. But what? Marriage is a give and take. When you first get married, your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to your wife. It belongs to your husband. When you have kids, now that responsibility is split and it belongs to your family, not to you. And you give and you give and you give, and that is what marriage is. If you're in a relationship for the take and not the give and not the yielding and not the respect and not the love, rethink. Understand your own emotional space where you are, reflect, read your Bible and reassess. Because here's the thing. We humans tend to feel, I do, I feel, I need. Use I statements when you're talking to your partner, because you're talking about me. So I realized that. I changed my vocabulary when I'm talking to my wife. I need this. You know, we don't need a new pickup truck. I need it. Amen? We don't need a motorcycle for the family. I need it. Make sure that when you're expressing personal needs, it's not a we thing. 
we need to go to Cabo and put it on the credit card. That is not a we thing. That is an I thing. A lot of families get into a lot of trouble because they think that a vacation overseas or going back home so mom can cook them the foods that they cooked when they were little and spending $10,000 going back home and not having a vacation because a family visit is not a family vacation. Let me tell you that. Don't lie to yourselves. I tried to do that with my wife. We ended up $5,000 in debt and it took us two years to get out of it. Never again. Don't think a family visit is a family vacation, number one. Don't think a vacation that you're going to put on your credit card is going to help your marriage refresh and reset. You're going to come back a lot more stressed than when you went. You think you need it, but what you need is to really work on your marriage. Sit down and talk. If you can't make time right now to go talk, a week sitting by a poolside is not going to fix your marriage. That money that you put in the credit card to get to that vacation is going to do a lot more harm in breaking the bridge. Let's not demystify asking for free help from professionals who deal with this often enough that's completely free when we're having trouble in our marriage. When you're having issues, talk to someone. But first, talk to your spouse. Build a bridge with them. Communicate. Talk about things. Do not allow this world to tell you what your marriage should be. Allow God to help you yield the authority of your body. Just as Jesus Christ yielded all authority to sinners to have himself crucified and die for his bride, so must we die for our spouse. Amen? Amen? See, when it's not about you and it's about the other person, it's a healthier relationship. When it's about I, you have to understand the difference between I and we. I want a healthy marriage. I want a healthy relationship. What are you doing about it? What I statements will I do? What statements will I tell my spouse? I will fix this. And I can tell you, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. There's no such thing as perfect yielding and perfect love. Only Jesus Christ had that but we can strive to do better. Amen? Amen. Let's demystify the fact that all our marriages are perfect. They're not. None are. But we can work on them. We can make them better. And as we're all waiting to get to Jesus Christ, we can build families that when we're in front of him, we can say, we did the best we could. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the wisdom in your word. Thank you, Lord, because you have made for a way For us to speak to our spouses when we have trouble and situations and problems. But Lord, when things get too bad, allow us to seek the correct help. Allow us not to go seeking in incorrect places for help with something that is so precious and so important. Allow us to demystify issues in marriage and allow us to understand that no marriage is perfect. But Lord, you can make us go that route. You can begin us on the path to sanctifying our homes, sanctifying our families, to be perfect, just like you. But on that path we shall stumble, but you shall pick us up. Please, Lord, lend us your hand as we need to take off from our needs and get back on our feet. In your holy name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen.